Thank you. I'm going to move this around. Oh, what a lovely sea of people. Beautiful crowd. I'm so happy to be here, so honored. Um, for those of you who don't know much about me, but probably very few people because I talk so much that you probably know a lot about me anyway by now. I'm Brazilian. That's is. Yeah, you're not going to believe it. If you look back, you're going to see my beautiful wife right there, Chris, and my lovely daughter, uh, Laura. Uh, yeah, that's true. She is my wife. Um, yeah, I know. I know. I pray more, probably. I know. Um, I, I want to start. Um, that's probably not the way you want to start your first sermon in the church. Probably with humor. Sorry. Um, I'm gonna, you're going to see something that they, they make allowances for me. I've got a marker there. That's where, as far as I can go. Um, and I'm going to explain why, why, why that is. Um, and, and apparently, yeah, he's working there to keep me in the frame. So you might be seeing me doing this. It's because of, yeah, the side view. Um, we are in the series, amazing series called Living Hope. Um, and I promised I would stick to my notes. That's to do with my background. So I'm Brazilian. Woo! Uh, there's some Brazilians there. I thought I was expecting that. I'm Brazilian. Hey! Um, and the reason I say that is really a full word. Like, bear with me. Um, I'm very tempted to walk around, to shout. That's our culture. You know what I mean? We learned it from early, tender age with our moms. They shout, and that's a good thing, I think. Uh, but I'll try to behave. So my wife told me, stick to your notes. So, yeah. And, and for those of you... I mean, English is my second language, right? So I speak Portuguese as my main language. I pretend I speak Spanish, and then I'm trying to speak English. So there's days where the switch is not there, and yeah, this is one of those days. So I'm, I'm definitely going to stick to my notes. And I have, I have a timer here, because I was thinking I, I had two hours, and then I was told I don't. Uh, it's an hour. No? <laughs> It's 30 minutes, so I had to shrink my sermon, shrink my sermon. It's not that I, I mean, as just explained, it's not that I'm so inspired, that I have so much to say. It's that we take, it takes me more words to say what I want. You, you know that, some bunches of Portuguese people there, Portuguese-speaking people. When we're learning English, we learn this beautiful phrase, how are you? But then in reality, you walk inside, what's up? And then, oh, I mean, whatever you learned just went out of the window, because you need more words to say what you want. Anyway, back to living hope. I'm so honored to be here, and this is a series that's really touched me. I didn't, well, if I have a timer, but don't start it, it's not going to work, is it? Okay, 30 minutes, that's going to be so hard. Anyway, um, so this series has really impacted me for many reasons. We always hear these words in the Bible, right? Um, living hope, living water, living bread. Help me out. There's probably some more, right? Living what? Stones. There's so many of them. Right? And I always wondered, and, and with me, that's how it started. I started preparing the sermon with that, and I went so far with it. I said, oh, God, take me back. Um, and, and the reason is, we are, in, 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 and I, I titled it, glorifying God and sharing the gospel through our sufferings. That's not very inviting, is it? I can see everyone, okay. Living hope, and yeah, right, through so my sufferings. I'm going to do a quick, very quick recap on, on what we've been seeing so far. And the guys before me, the pastors before me, have done an amazing job in laying out these truths of Scripture very clearly. Um, so there's not a lot to say about that. But we've been in this book of First Peter. So the, the thing really is that uh, in the Scriptures is really suffering for the gospel, as a way of sharing the sufferings of Christ. So we suffer because he suffered. In this way, we show the gospel to people. So Peter's actually trying with a very hard mission to encourage Christians who are scattered uh, over a region called Asia Minor, included different places, but mainly Turkey. Whenever I say that, it makes me hungry. I don't know why. But um, so they are suffering a great deal, and they were about to suffer even more. So he had a very hard mission ahead of him to encourage them to remain faithful to God and respond godly. That's the thing, isn't it? Uh, to authorities in times of great persecution. That is, I mean, always as I, I move along uh, the story, it's important for you to try and, and see how that fits in with our story here. Um, we're not necessarily in exile, but if we think about it, the Bible does say that we are not from here. So we are on the earth as strangers, 
So in theory, we are in exile. Maybe some of you, you came from another country, and you feel like sometimes, well, definitely, looking outside, one may get the impression that they are under persecution. Anyway, so Peter gets very specific about what it means uh, to be God's uh, elected people, um, having Christ as the foundation stone and the building, the, the, the godly, the, uh, what, what do you call it? The spiritual house God is building. So it's really important to see ourselves that way because that makes it, that gives it a different, that gives us purpose to start with, right? So God sees me, that's how God sees me, right? As a building block, as a building, as, as part of the building, he is building. So he's going to use me so other people can see God's house, can see the dwelling place of God. Um, that's the idea. So I'm going to reread the text for you. Uh, Slaves, in heaven and in reverent fear, in reverent fear of God, submit yourselves to your masters, not only to those who are good and considerate, but also to those who are harsh. For it is, com- for it is commendable if someone bears up under the pain of unjust suffering because they are conscious of God. But how is it to your credit if you receive a, beat- a beating for doing wrong and endure it? But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. First Peter 2, 18, 20. When I go about um, trying to draw from Scripture what the Lord is trying to teach there, and, and it's really important that we want that. We want to know what God really wants to say from a text so we don't run into the risk of drawing our own conclusions and actually being the ones interpreting the Scriptures. That's really a mistake. The, the Scriptures interpret itself. Right, so we, we, it, but how I go about it, I, I start by trying to remove from the text what finding out what's not saying. Do you know what I mean? Because you, you run the risk of finding so many avenues that are always probably saying that, depending on how your emotions are, how you feel about it, how you're feeling on that day. You might make the text fit your situation, and that's a big risk. So I normally start by finding out what the text is not saying. Then and the hope is that I'm left with what the text is saying. So let's try and do that with the text. So a few things the text is not saying. It's not saying God endorses slavery. I'm not going to go into great detail explaining that because the word there, slaves, is not the right, the best interpretation, the best tr- translation. It's really how servant. Uh, the other thing is uh, not saying that God approved of the first century Greco, as I call it, Roman uh, society. We need to understand that God reveals his will progressively through history. And God not tackling something doesn't mean that he's not working to change that thing that we're thinking about that is wrong, right? It's also not saying that we ought to obey sinful decrees. Uh, why do I say that? How can we obey and not obey? The thing is this. The, the word is, is, is the the marker for us to decide what we need to obey and not to obey. For example, we had lockdown. Some churches, they decided to continue to have their services. Well, arguably, some of them could be seen in a great light. We, for example, at Redeemer, decided to continue to have our services online. So we would not, uh, I, I don't know, maybe not, it wouldn't go down well with the neighborhood who are actually concerned about their health. So we found a way. But some people decided to continue to have their services in spite of government recommendation. Peter and Paul themselves, they many times they disobeyed the laws, right? But the thing here is, the, the, the trick here, and I think the secret is that whenever you have to do it, you ought to accept the punishment for that. You need to be ready for it to submit to the authorities when the punishment comes. That's what they did. So, it's also not saying that we deserve to be beaten up for doing wrong. I think some people can get that impression there, but it's not what it's saying. It's just saying that we don't get a credit if we get beaten up for not doing wrong. For doing wrong, that's what I said. Or rather, we get a credit if we get mistreated uh, for doing good. Um, it's also not saying that God expects us to put a front, a facade, uh, when inwardly our desire is really to punch somebody, right? Um, I'm not sure if you've been there, but yeah, that's normally what it is. So it's rather saying that we ought to submit to earthly authorities as on to the Lord. That's the tricky bit. I'm going to read f- uh, to you Ephesians 6, 5 to 7. Seven minutes already. Oh, God, it's going fast. 
It says, slaves, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear and with sincerity of heart. That's the trick here. Just as you would obey Christ. Obey them, not to win the favor when their eyes are on you, but as the slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from your heart. Serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not people. Yeah, that's beautiful. But I need to tell you, I struggle with that. I'm going to give you a quick example. As I was preparing for the sermon, I shared this with a few people. I went to football. How many of you know that Christians, you can know how mature a Christian is when he plays football, <laughs> especially if he's a Brazilian, because Brazilians think they play really well, but they don't normally. It's my case anyway. Um, so I went to play football last Thursday or the Thursday before. I don't even remember now because I'm so taken aback by by what happened there. So I went to football, and there was this guy. There's always a guy. Do you know what I mean? When you're doing something, there's always someone that marks your story. There was this guy. I think he had a lapse of memory or something, and then in his mind, when he saw me, he saw the ball. Maybe, I, I don't know, I'm slightly overweight, but that's another story. And he would kick me in ways you wouldn't believe it for no reason. The ball was not next to us. I would receive a kick elbow, and all these things. As you can imagine, I'm a Christian, obviously, and I'm studying the text, right? I knew the text. Yeah, and I started to fight back, right? Because in the end of the day, everything, there is a limit, right? I mean, you know it. Um, the problem is that when we finished the game, and the worst is we were winning, miraculously, we were winning. And that made it ever more worse. Do you know what I mean? The guy hated me so much. We, shake, we shook hands in the end, that was it. And I went home, I said, oh, I did my bit, right? And I, I shook his hands. But you know, when you know that you know that you did wrong, oh God, the Holy Spirit really spoke to me. And it wasn't nice. You know what I mean? He assured me, yes, son, you did wrong. Yeah, anyway, so that's how I struggled with this truth. Do you know what I mean? Because the, the main thing is, it's, it's a beautiful thing that we, we might be able to even endure it. But the problem is when our innermost being wants to fight back, there is a problem because that's not what the text is saying. Well, at least it doesn't look like it. For instance, I didn't rejoice <laughs> when treated unfairly because of the gospel. I was not thinking about the gospel. I, yeah, I've got to be honest. Um, First Peter 4.13 says, But rejoice in as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may, you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. Well, yes, overjoyed is not really the word. Um, I often try to change. That's the thing with me. And then after that, I would normally go in this mode. I try to change my behavior, hoping that this would result in my heart being changed. But it hasn't happened because it happens again and again in a vicious, vicious cycle. And I understand more and relate more to what Paul said. Not that I'm comparing myself to Paul, but in Romans 7, 15, he said, I do not understand what I do. I certainly don't. For what I, I, for what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. Well, is it fair to say that we all struggle with this? To different degrees. I see a lot of nodding there. Yes. Oh, go for it. Okay. Um, and if you're wondering, well, maybe not. We don't. I'm really, consider I'm talking about another church, but another Christians. Uh, Ephesians 5, 22 and 28. I'm going to read it to you. But basically, it's the theme of the New Testament. It's all about serving, suffering, enduring patiently, doing things as you do for God, as you were doing for Christ. So, with a good attitude and wholeheartedly. That's the difference, right? So, we know that that is the truth, right? For example, Ephesians 5, 21 to 28 says, and this is a very, it's quoted so many times, right? Especially, I think husbands use this verse to get away with a lot of things, but I think they emphasize the wrong part of the verse, but I'm going to read to you. It instructs us to submit to one another. That's how the verse is started. Right Then goes on to say, wives, submit to your husbands. And husbands very cleverly pick this out, right? I'm not saying that I do it. She knows, right? Oh, my mother, yeah. 
Um, so they forget. There's actually, we're supposed to submit to one another. I think what really happened here, I'm trying to, I see everything in pictures. So I'm, I see this, this scene. God is speaking to the man on the sofa doing nothing, not paying attention. Oh, submit to one another. And the wife is there. The wife is there working, looking after the kid, cooking, cleaning, everything at the same time. She's obviously not paying attention. So she said, he says again, wives, listen up. Okay, but it's for everybody. Uh, and yet, we know this is true, but how come, if statistics, if statistics are right, apparently 30% is the divorce rate amongst Christians. I probably shouldn't say that. Um, that's really discouraging, isn't it? But isn't that the truth of the gospel? How that, what's the connection here? So I ask you, what do you think the problem is? Yeah, just answer in your head. Um, I'm going to read to you what the scripture says about it, uh, especially the last part of the verse 17, Galatians 5, 16 to 17. It says, So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh, for the flesh desire what's contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what's contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, um, so that you are not to do whatever you want. Not doing what God wants is a sin, and we know that, right? But yet we do it. Um, and it's basically doing whatever we want. My impression is that we often want to avoid suffering because deep inside we're afraid. I think that, that's really what happens. We're afraid of being hurt. And in, in essence, it's almost like we think too much of ourselves. Uh, I think that's how it goes. Uh, so Thomas Merton said this, the truth that many people never understand until it's too late is that the more you try to avoid suffering, the more you suffer. Because the smaller and more insignificant things begin to torture you in proportion to your fear, fear of being hurt. That's really true, isn't it? Anyway, to lighten the mood a little bit, because I see a lot of people like, oh, I might not be suffering for the gospel. Oh, God, what do I do now? Okay, let me give you some perspective. Again, it might not work for you. If you hear something, there might be a lot of elbows going on, wives doing this for husbands now. I'm going to address husbands, wives, and even kids, right? A reality check on suffering. Okay, men, moving from the sofa to take the bin out when your wife asks you to, it's not suffering for the gospel. A lot of elbows going on there. There's a lot, I've seen a lot of elbows. You can't see it. I can see it here. Okay, okay. Another one, hosting your in-laws and doing the dishes, on top of that, is not suffering for the gospel. Not watching football to go on a date night is not suffering for the gospel either. Now the women, okay. Listening patiently to your husband while he brags about and exaggerates his achievements in fishing or football is not suffering for the gospel. Finishing your plate when he cooks and saying it was... Amazing, it's not suffering for the gospel. Well, it does feel that everything applies to men, doesn't it? Yeah, that's really bad. Kids, make your own beds, it's not suffering for the gospel, right? You need to do it. Okay. Let's move to the second uh, set of scriptures for today. So, I'm going to read from, from the Amplified Version, even though what's there is from the NIV. For as a believer, you have been called for this purpose, since Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example, so that you may follow in his footsteps. He committed no sin, nor was deceit ever found in his mouth. While being reviled and insulted, he did not revile or insult in return while suffering. He made no threats of vengeance, but kept entrusting himself to him who, judged, who judges fairly. He personally cared our sins in his body on the cross, Willingly offering himself on it as an, oh God, where is my uh, English today? As an altar of sacrifice, so that we might die to sin, become an immune from the penalty and power of sin, and live for righteousness. For by his wounds, you who believe have been healed. For you were continually wandering like so many sheep, but now you have come back to the shepherd and guardian of your souls. We know that salvation is a free gift of God to those who put that faith, trust in Jesus. But it wasn't free. We know that, right? 
it cost God the best he had. The Lamb of God, Jesus, had to go silently to the cross. But Jesus didn't go straight to the, co- the cross. He was penalized on the cross. He was beat up on the cross. And the reason for that, we see in Galatians 3.13, where it goes on to say that he became cursed for us in our place. And we know that that's how we've become the righteousness of God. That he who had no sin was made sin for us. So it makes it even more important that Jesus had to suffer for our complete healing, restoration, deliverance. That's the beauty of the gospel. And we are called to share in his sufferings as a way of showing Jesus to the world. Augustine said this, God had one son on earth without sin, but never one without suffering. We now know what the text says. We know how and why we struggle. So the question really is, how do I live it out wholeheartedly? That's really the question I'm asking myself. How can I rejoice in suffering for the gospel? Well, let's find some clues, if my time is not up, from scriptures, right? Okay, still good to go. There seems to be a connection between suffering, and I, 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 suffering is, is the overarching word for submitting to leadership, submitting to one another, because a lot of times it's hard. How many of you have ever come across, don't need to put your hands up, please, uh, come across people who are very difficult to love? That is true, right? Oh, so many people trying to hold, yeah. So many people are hard to love. And how about, well, I thought that, but then Holy Spirit speaks to me in a way like, okay, how about you, <laughs> right? I mean, we crucified Jesus. Like, he went to the cross because of me so that I could go free. So there is a connection between enduring suffering and witnessing for Christ. Matthew 5, 16 says, In the same way, let your light shine before men, that they might see your good deeds and glorify the Father in heaven. Think about that for a moment. Christ is the light source, right? When I, you and I, love sacrificially like he did, what it is is we are giving the world who is, which is in darkness an opportunity to see the light of Christ. Isn't that amazing? When we share in the sufferings of Christ, the light of Jesus shines bright through our lives. So people who wouldn't, wouldn't otherwise be open to listen to the voice of God or to, to listen to Jesus can see Jesus in us. So there seems to be a connection between enduring suffering and loving your neighbor. The verse we just read before, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. So God loved, he gave. Jesus loved, he suffered and submitted to God. Loving like Jesus tells me I am to suffer for him so I can become one in his suffering. Sharing the gospel is also sharing the sufferings of Christ. There is a missing, a missing piece in the story. So in our question, in our quest, not our question, our rope quest, uh, to find out uh, what, what, what the piece is, let's zoom in on the life of Peter. So as you know, Peter, it was probably not the most clever of the bunch, right? I see myself in Peter a lot, probably not because of that, but he didn't start out being a role model, the best role model for suffering, did he? I mean... Just think about that. Luke 5 tells you the story of his conversion, right? Jesus comes into his boat. Isn't that a beautiful story? Has Jesus ever come into your life? Okay, any parallels there? So Jesus comes into his boat and actually changes his story because Jesus tells him, well, he, remember, Peter was a fisherman. I mean, a fisherman is probably someone that knows how to fish, you would think, right? Jesus comes into his boat and changes the way he operates. Actually tells him, okay, I'm going to tell you how to fish, right? So he listens to Jesus. It's blessed in the sense that he has a big catch on that night, probably the biggest of his life. I don't know. So that's Luke 5. And Jesus tells him, tells him something prophetically. He probably didn't realize that. Jesus says, I'm going to make you 
a catcher of men or a fisher of men, right? So he was a fisherman to become a fisher of men. Peter probably didn't understand. So Acts 2.14 is when Peter preaches and 3,000 people get saved. Isn't that amazing, the fulfillment of the promise? But in between Luke 5 and and Acts 2.14, a lot happened, right? So maybe you're in the middle of your life and you think your life is ending. Let me tell you this. Well, it's not. Do you know what I mean? You started out with Jesus. Think God rough. Yeah, that's true. But God is the one who planned it out for you. So he's going to be at the end with you. So it doesn't matter so much how you do now. It matters how you finish your race, right? That's what the Bible indicates. But Peter denied Jesus three times. That's him. I mean, he feared for his life. How is that? I mean, in terms of suffering for the gospel, when you fear for your life, it's not really good, is it? Try to stop Jesus from going to the cross. Behave hypocritically. That's in Galatians. So what happened to this guy? How come he's, is this fisherman, doubtful fisherman, really keen on talking when it was the wrong time? Become this guy that goes on to preach and 3,000 people get saved by his message. Well, his life changed based on the promise of Jesus. Acts 1.8 says this, But you, receive, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witness in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the world. The missing, piece, the missing piece is the ministry of the Holy Spirit in the lives of the believers. We need the Holy Spirit. The working of the Holy Spirit is what makes us empowered to be Jesus to the dying world out there. Jesus came to give life and give it more abundantly. So that's why he placed on us the Holy Spirit to empower us to go and do the works of Jesus. Not so that we get more people in the church in the sense of we want to have numbers. It's so that the world is saved. God, the the Bible says, it's God's will that all are saved right? That, that's what the Bible says. Let's reread that for you in context. So you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses. Witnesses, I put in brackets there, able to endure suffering and justice, submit graciously to leaders. In Jerusalem, that is your, your home, your family. In all Judea, your neighbors. In Samaria, beyond that, in the city, and to the end of the world. I'd never looked before Sometimes when we study in the Bible, you love to go and see the Greek. So you know how to say fancy words. Oh, this says this in Greek. Anyway, and I, and I go to Greece, I can barely ask for breakfast. Um, I don't know why, but anyway. So when, in the Greek, there's two words there I, I want to highlight and put here. You will receive what power when the Holy Spirit comes on you? So you receive power, and then you be our witnesses. Maybe we're trying to be witnesses without the power. Could that be true? I don't know. That's a question to ask. But what is the word power? Really is the the word in Greek. I'm going to say it very nicely and and as if I know Greek. Dunamis, right? Wow, it sounded, the response was really bad. But anyway, dunamis, it means, it's the, the root word for the English word dynamite. So it's an explosive power. What dynamite really is, I mean, nothing can, in theory, contain it. If you're around it and it explodes, it will get you right? It will knock you down. Be sure of that. So the other word, witnesses, it was a surprise. When I look up the Greek, it's, I'm not going to pronounce it properly, but it's the word martyrs, um, root for the word, the English word martyr. Am I saying martyrs? And do you know what I mean? Like as if I'm saying a lady's name, martyr. Anyway, it sounds like that. Anyway, I'll, I'll keep saying it as if you understand it. So What it's actually saying, telling me, if I'm going to receive power to be witnesses, this power is going to impact me in such a way that I'm not going to fear for my life. Again, you might be thinking, well, but I fear for my life. No. When we receive the power, we won't fear for our lives. We won't fear for our egos. We we will let go of our egos or our, our... us being afraid of, of how we're going to be received, that's, that's really what happened to Peter, isn't it? They went to death um, without being afraid. So we already received the power when we received the Holy Spirit, the power to become martyrs. 
Let's understand real quickly what the ministry of the Holy Spirit really is. Oh God. 27 minutes. Uh, Holy Spirit comforts, uh, intercedes, counsels, and strengthens, helps. Tells of our oneness with God. Fills us with the love of God. Confirms we are the children of God. Teaches us how to pray. Convicts the world of sin. The slide now is going to show you a picture. I'm going to run real quickly. Probably just need five minutes. I was praying to the message. And I was sleeping. I had a vision. I don't want to creep you out with a vision. I know this is in the Bible. You're going to see it in the Bible. Go there and look. That's to do with um, the Bible for sure. And as I was meditating in this vision, I had this vision. It's not exactly like that. And I was thinking and praying for the church. And it was clear to me that beyond the mountains, heaven, and here, the earth, we are connected. This bridge connects earth and heaven. This, for some reason, there was no signs in there, but I knew this bridge was called Living Hope. The water here, surrounded by the love of God. And, and I... I was puzzled, and I kept praying about it to have an interpretation of what that was. And then I felt God really impress my heart with an understanding of what that was. This is the ideal life of a Christian. Through our meditation on the heaven realities, we ought to live crossing this bridge, right? This is what connects us to heaven. A bridge, what it does, it enables what is there on the other side to come to this side. Isn't that what happens? So what happened? So if you think we can have goods come from one place to the other because of the bridge. And praying to it, I feel like our church is transitioning. There's a mindset change that's going to take place. We're going to start living in heaven realities. And then God spoke to me very specific words. Heaven is not our end goal. It's where we start our journey. It's our starting point. We don't serve so we go to heaven. We serve because we've been there. This is a strong point here. Because the Bible says that when we're born again, we're born from above. So in theory, because of the Spirit in us, we can understand and know the mind of God. We can know what's in heaven. We know what awaits for us. If you think about this... Jesus manifested heaven realities, healing, deliverance, restoration, and he said we ought to do the same. Wasn't it? Just think about Jesus. Jesus was heaven agent on earth. Remember that he told you how to pray. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. There's no sickness. No one depressed in heaven. There's no suffering, no pain, no crying. This is what he did. He went around because of he knew where he was from. He manifested that on earth in the place around him. The gifts of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control are the answer to every problem we'll ever encounter. So we know that we, are, we carry the fruits of the Spirit, don't we? Just think about that. Everything that we mentioned, conflict starts because someone needs something. They don't want to get it. So you carry the answer to people's problems, to your problems. These are the fruits of the Spirit. If you think about love, kindness, goodness, they are the answer to every conflict. And you are carrying it. You're bringing those goods from heaven to earth and manifesting around you. So actually people are starting to experience heaven because you are there. So it makes you think twice about the importance you have in the kingdom of God. God actually thinks that way. It's easier to understand why God says things like this. You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you might declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Okay. Finish up. There's so much that could be said about this. I want to let you digesting it. One thing about prophecy. You don't judge the prophet. You judge the prophecy. Take it with you. Go to the word. God, that guy's crazy. He said this thing. I, yeah, where is it? Go to the word. <laughs> Few things you need to do.
be filled with the Spirit by drinking from the Word of God. The Bible says that that the Spirit of God is in the Word. As you drink from the Word, you're going to be filled with the Spirit up to the point where you're going to overflow. That word that says rivers of living water are going to come out of you, right? We don't make it happen. It's the Spirit. As we get filled, it's a natural uh, result. Find out and meditate on your inheritance in Christ. When we understand what's waiting for us, it's so easy to let go of the things of this earth. The realities of this world are nothing compared to what's waiting for us in heaven. Manifest heaven and earth by walking in Jesus' footsteps. I have a saying, I'd never seen anyone healed until I prayed for someone to be healed. The Bible says, you ought to do the works of Jesus. We, we ought to go out, pray for people, be with people, love people. So a lot of the environment we are running from is an environment that we are allowed to be created because we are refraining from blessing the world around us. I want to encourage us to be meditating on these things and knowing that we have the power. That's the encouraging bit, bit for us. And I'm finished. 33 minutes. I want to pray for you. Gil, please come up. I want to invite two groups of people. I'm not going to do anything creepy like raise your hands. That's probably a bit too advanced for you now. You're not, you're not yet Brazilian. So, um, but yeah. I, I think there's a word of God. This is God's word for you. I think there's two groups of people here. People actually say, oh, I want to go on this journey. <laughs> I want to give my life to this Jesus and surrender completely. As they are playing, as they are playing let, let, let's just meditate on that. There's two groups of people. And people that actually, oh, I want this. Oh, this is <laughs> it's exciting. I want this journey for me. I, I'm tired of this world and I can't do it on my own. I need Jesus. So maybe that's you. I just want you to say, well, you, you, you're seen, you're heard. And you're acknowledged here. So as we pray, take it to you. And, and you, you can come later to the front and ask for a specific prayer if you want to give your life to Jesus. But there is a group of people here who have been challenged today. And that's the gospel. It's a challenging word. And you say, wow, I want to embrace suffering for the gospel. I won't let go of the things that are holding me down. And, and if that's you, I, I want to pray for you. And, and I just want you to embrace this challenge and say, well, Lord... If that's for me, I'm here. I'm ready. I, I, I want to go for it. Amen? Let's sing and let's pray and let's sing and let's pray. Let's dance. In the house of the Lord, there's freedom where the Spirit is. So many of you carrying the Spirit of God here. There must be a freedom in this place. And how about you stand up and as we sing, we pray. You pray in your heart. Maybe if you feel very fancy today, you might hope hands of someone next to you or feel like you're praying for somebody how about we stand up shall we heads bowed eyes closed if you feel like holding someone's hand yeah fine if not it's okay just want to pray for you this guy's going to take us into worship father god i want to thank you that you are such a loving god father we are not here by chance and the only reason we're not there with you yet it's because you called us into this beautiful mission of showing the light of your son Jesus to the world around us. Father, help us to embrace the challenges that come with suffering for the gospel. Help us to see these, these events as an opportunities that we have to witness for Christ. Help us to be bold and come into your presence whenever we need, the hiding place of God, that we find rest, we find refuge. Father, as a good father, you never, you will never protect us too much so that we don't experience your presence. We don't experience what it is to live by faith. We don't experience what it is to encounter the love of God. You might allow us to go really deep in our own understanding 
But Father, we want to declare that we love you. We worship you, Father. Jesus is the Son of God, the Lamb of God who died in my place. We worship you because of Jesus, Father. And some of you here want to give our lives to Jesus. And while that might be a process or uh, require more talking, Father, I love when the Bible says that that man said, well, when he was inquired about, about what happened to him, oh, who is this guy that healed you? And he said, oh, who he is, I don't know whether he sinned or he not sinned. One thing I know, I was blind and now I see. I pray that God opens our vision. Father, help us to see heaven for what it is. Help us to live in heaven in our minds and renew our minds to the realities of your kingdom so we can manifest your kingdom on earth and live according to the role you gave us, ambassadors of Christ. Father, for those of you, for those of my brothers, here and sisters who embrace this challenge, fathers, I pray that you, you fill them up with the Spirit, show them the way, guide them in life so that they, they can see your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. Let's sing.